which we'll talk about. Uh, I'm CFS rain over the Great Lakes. I was in that forecast, and Jeff Manick and we'll also have some material. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, Tropical Storm Bonnie. Already the second storm in the uh, Atlantic hurricane season, which started yesterday. And the East Coast rainfall, I'll talk about that too. I thought I would start off by showing uh, a bunch of <coughs> slides here, um, a bunch of pictures of the climatology of the most likely uh, areas of genesis and storm tracks for each month uh, in the hurricane season. You can see that in June, you tend to get these more homegrown storms um, and a uh, large likelihood of um, storms forming in the Gulf, the eastern Gulf, which we're already starting to see uh, some signs next week for the third storm. Uh, and then you can see during the peak months, you tend to get uh, more of these African wave type storms. Uh, and that those are the peak months of the hurricane season. And this is the outlook for uh, the 2016 Atlantic hurricane season. Uh, we're looking at near normal conditions. Uh, predicted 10 to 16 named storms, uh, 4 to 8 hurricanes, and then 1 to 4 major hurricanes. And here are the different names for this season. We've already had Alex back in January, and then Bonnie, and we might have Colin next week. Uh, the outlook is usually uh, formed based on ENSO conditions. And so this is uh, the latest forecast for the uh, Nino 3.4 index from the North North American Multimodal Ensemble. And you can see that really during the, the peak months of the hurricane season, all of the models here are forecasting uh, La Nina conditions. So usually that means uh, increased activity in the Atlantic. And as far as uh, sea surface temperature anomalies, we have r really warm conditions in the Gulf and Caribbean and off the East Coast, uh, cooler than normal conditions in the North Atlantic warmer in the central Atlantic and cooler uh, closer to the uh, equator. These are the actual sea surface temperatures. And just to emphasize how warm it is uh, in the Gulf and Caribbean and uh, cooler off of the West African coast. This is the uh, storm track of Tropical Storm Bonnie. A couple things to note is that uh, Bonnie was a weak system. It did upgrade to a tropical storm but only briefly, only for about 12 hours, uh, from 21Z to 28th to 9Z to 29th. Uh, and then Bonnie weakened as it made landfall in uh, East South Carolina. And uh, I think it was just east of Charleston. And South Carolina got hit the hardest. Uh, many areas received at least six inches of rain. Some areas even uh, exceeded 10 inches of rain. And Bonnie also stalled for quite a while, uh, or X, um, to, the, to the east of South Carolina. There was just weak upper level winds and really nothing from the west to push Bonnie out to sea. This was, uh, this, so this was an analysis from the GFS around the time of Bonnie's formation, or a couple days before it uh, formed. And what we had was a ridge and then lower pressures uh, just east of Florida. So this is a good setup, and the, the ensembles were showing this pretty far out. Um, so this was a good setup for, uh, for some tropical genesis uh, southeast of uh, Florida. And there was also a stationary front that was located around the area where Bonnie ended up forming. And you can very clearly see that stationary front uh, in the water vapor image. This is from the 25th, May 25th. A uh, huge contrast between dry and moist air. There was also very little uh, wind shear that Bonnie had to deal with around the area of its uh, genesis. And this is a water vapor image um, from the 26th, around the time when Bonnie was starting to form. And this is the National Hurricane Center outlook from May 25th. Uh, there was a medium probability that Bonnie would form, but then the next day, uh, the next day, um, they upgraded to high high probability, greater than 60% chance uh, for the next five days that a tropical storm would form. 
And so these are the, this is the surface analysis. Uh, this is starting on the plain ice. Shows Bonnie just off the coast of South Carolina and a pretty weak system, uh, 10,009, or uh, 1,009 millibars. And then you can see that Bonnie kind of stalls and then moves a little bit to the northeast. And the latest is that Bonnie is uh, just off the coast of North Carolina. Uh, still a weak system, but causing some rain. And another problem with Bonnie was the uh, rip currents that were created Memorial Day weekend in South Carolina, Georgia. So these are the forecasts for the tracks and the intensity. Uh, this is starting from the zero-z cycle on the 26th. And uh, the intensity plots are the minimum pressure. And I, again, put these black X's here as the verification. I tried to um, line where the track was. And you can see that the H warp, uh, which is the purple, started off too far to the north, was actually forecasting landfall more South Carolina, North Carolina border. <coughs> and the H warp was actually too weak for this particular cycle. And then I'm going to go every 12 hours here. So uh, now we have the GFS in blue, the GFDL in green, and the H warp in purple. And um, you can see pretty good agreement between the models here uh, towards South Carolina. And then uh, it seems that the GFS was suggesting that maybe Bonnie would stall a little bit, whereas the H warp and GFDL kind of took it to the northeast a little quicker. And the H warp was a little bit too strong for this run. The GFDL was, was pretty close to the uh, verified intensities. Uh, 0 Z to 27, the models were all in really good agreement, um, but just a little bit to the north of where Bonnie tracked. And they, they diverged once Bonnie made landfall uh, over South Carolina. And uh, you can see that the forecast for the intensity were pretty good out until about the 60-hour forecast when the models were just a little bit too strong, the H warp and the GFDO. And still really good agreement. And now the models are showing more of a northeast turn, uh, which is basically what happened. Still a little bit too far to the north, uh, but really good agreement. And pretty good with the intensity forecast. Again, just still a tad too strong in the forecast. And then, so this continues. Uh, the GFDL started to be too strong uh, around this time, the May 28th to May 30th cycle. Each work was a little bit better, closer to the verification, but still really good agreement. Uh, GFS, again, is showing what looks like stalling near South Carolina, which is what happened. The GFDL is too far inland. Uh, 12Z to 28, the models are still showing uh, at least the GFS and the H warp and the GFDL actually are all showing more of an inland track, whereas the storm moves more up the coast um, to the northeast. And uh, the GFDL continues to be a little bit too strong. Zero Z made, made the 29th cycle. Uh, the H warp was showing pretty far inland, this track, uh, which was different from the other cycles. But the GFDL and the uh, GFS especially had uh, better forecasts farther to the east. And the GFDL uh, continued to be a little bit too strong with the intensity forecast. And then as we keep going, you see that the models tend to be a little bit too far to the west. Uh, GFS is doing pretty well, though, with the, with the track. And then the models, I, I, they trended a little bit more to the east as we got closer. And uh, the GFS ended up having the best track forecast uh, overall, which I'll show in a plot later. And so these are the plots. This is the track error plot. Uh, the GFS had the lowest track errors out to 72 hours. The H warp had the highest with the GFDL in the middle. The intensity uh, maximum wind errors are uh, pretty close. Uh, you can see more of a difference beyond the 36-hour forecast. The GFDL had the lowest errors. The um, GFS had the highest. And the reason the GFS had the highest was because it tended to be uh, far too weak compared to observations. The other models, like the H-Warp and the GFDL, 
as we saw, tended to be just a little bit too strong in their forecast of the intensity. So looking at some of the precipitation forecasts, uh, focusing on South Carolina and along the East Coast, I wanted to show this loop of uh, precipitable water from the 29th to the uh, 1st. And what I wanted to point out was you could see the, the moisture associated with Bonnie, uh, but there was also a lot of moisture that was just coming up because of a high pressure system that was transporting moisture um, from, the, uh, from the southeast. So at, at least farther to the north, it seemed like a lot of that rain was, um, or some of it was not directly associated with Bonnie. But South Carolina definitely got hit um, the hardest because of Bonnie. So these are forecasts for 24-hour accumulated precipitation, ending 12Z to 29th. And I start off with the 84-hour forecast. Verification is in the bottom middle. Uh, and then I have the NAM, the NAM RR, GFS, the Canadian global model, and then the European, which wasn't available for this run. But so you can see that the, uh, the, high, the heaviest rainfall was focused South Carolina, Georgia border here. And for the 84-hour forecast, most of the models were completely missing it at this point. Uh, the Canadian looked the best, but was just a little bit too far to the north and east. Wasn't capturing the fact that Georgia would get some heavy rainfall as well. And then the 72-hour forecast, the models are doing a little bit better. Still, the Canadian looks the best. Uh, but was not heavy enough, um, and the uh, the NAM looked a little bit better, but they were still really missing that heavy rainfall in South Carolina. 60 hour forecast. It looked like the GFS was light. Was it was the GFS light moving storm in, or was it something else? Yeah, that I, that's my guess that they were slow, because yeah, all that all of that. Uh, moisture, all that precip is off the coast and not over land yet. But it did start to get better. Uh, the 60 hour forecast, so the GFS is looking a little bit better, but still not still missing a lot of that heavy rainfall. Um, the GEM is actually too far to the north and east, still missing the Georgia rainfall. And um, it looks like the NAM was not concentrated enough. The I thought that the NAM RR looked a little bit better, uh, but was still too light still too light compared to verification. 48 hour forecast. The Canadian looks uh, not too great for this particular cycle. Way too light over South Carolina and Georgia. GFS looks a little bit better. I thought the GFS near best here because because the uh, the NAM and the NAM RR were, were just too far to the north and east, uh, especially the NAM. And then the 36-hour forecast, all the models, uh, except for the NAM, really, were showing a bullseye pretty much over South Carolina, but still too light compared to verification and still missing that Georgia rainfall. This is a big problem with the models. And then the 24-hour the, uh, forecast, all the models were showing heavy rainfall pretty much in the vicinity of South Carolina. But again, we're not extending farther to the south and west like the verification shows. And then uh, ending 12Z the 30th, starting again with the 84-hour forecast. So now, so now in the verification, we see this narrow band of heavy rainfall going up the East Coast. Um, and still South Carolina, Georgia border uh, receives a lot of rainfall in that time period. And so uh, for the 84-hour forecast, the models really struggled with this narrow band. Uh, it seemed like the Canadian was a little bit overdone, but did show what looked like up and down the coast heavy rainfall. Uh, the NAM RR also, you could see sort of a banding signature, but too far to the west, <coughs> and missing out on some of that uh, northern precip. And then uh, 72 hour forecast. The models still seem to struggle. I noticed that the GFS actually suggested uh, heavy rainfall really to the over DC and to the north uh, and west, which did not occur. And uh, the models just had trouble really concentrating that rainfall into that narrow band. And the uh, Canadian was lacking the heavier rainfall to the north. Forgive me for being distracted here, but the uh, 
Euro was the only model that really had any clue extreme events over such mm -hmm. Yes, I understand. Well, you have a like A number of us do, but uh, yeah, but that's uh, that's a high impact event at day three that was not captured. Okay. Uh, the sixty hour forecast models are it seems to me like the NAM and the NAM RR were uh, more scattered, more diffuse with the uh, heavy rainfall. Uh, the GFS and the GEM were showing kind of a narrow banding, but it still seemed like the GEM was doing it a little bit. 48 hour forecast. Uh, uh, here was a situation where it looked like the NAM was concentrated with that narrow banding. The NAM R looked a little bit better, I thought, but was still uh, missing some of that heavier rainfall to the north. And uh, the GFSC and, and European all look pretty good for the most part. We're just in kind of this narrow band. 36 hour forecast. Uh, the GFS and the Canadian looked more concentrated, I thought, than the NAM and the NAM RR. Um, they were missing some of that heavy rainfall, but this was difficult to evaluate because it was such a narrow band of rainfall. And then the 24 hour forecast. Uh, the GFS and the European seemed underdone here with the rainfall compared to verification. The Canadian seemed overdone, and the uh, NAM and the NAM RR look okay, uh, but are still missing some of that heavier precip that verified to the north. And then uh, Corey will go through some high-resolution ensembles. See, so yeah, I'll jump in here and go through some more the cam. Just, uh, Reiterating what Trace already pointed out with their precipital water loop, this is 100 millibar plots. With precipital water in the fill, it's in millimeters, and so this is at four times, 0 to 29, 12 to 29, 0 to 30, and 12 to 30. We see Bonnie over South Carolina, the cyclonic flow field around that, and the downstream ridge has an anticyclonic field between them, some confluent southerly flow, which really helps to transport that higher precipital water northward. By 12 down to 30, you see these amounts over 40 millimeters all across uh, the Mid-Atlantic and eastern New England. Uh, Chatham had a value around 1.9 inches, which, according to FCC sound and climatology, was its daily maximum because it sounded a pretty anomalous moisture setting up that narrow band of precipitation. Looking at this from an SEO perspective, and this is a storm scale and solid opportunity that the FCC assembled from uh, seven models. This has been the focus of uh, one of the focuses of the spring experiment. This is sort of a baseline for convection welling ensemble that any implemented operational ensemble would hopefully be. And so the seven members of this are the NSSL wharf, uh, two uh, ARW high res windows, one that's initialized at the uh, ensemble initialization time, and one that is 12 hours prior to that ensemble time. Then the corresponding NMMB high res windows. There's also an NNM member that's run by Matt Pyle here at the FCC and Jess for the FCO. And then the NAM mess is the seventh member. And what's uh, going to be relevant for some of the plots I show is that you'll see the missile wharf and then the NNM and the NAM mess all get their initial conditions from the NAM, while the other models, the high-res windows, get their initial conditions from the RAP. And that may be a reason why um, the high-res windows seem to perform separately from what the other three members did, which you'll see in the plots here. So what's plotted here on the bottom left is the 24-hour precipitation from the 12 to 28th cycle of the SSEO, really showing this 24-hour period where there's heavy precipitation uh, in South Carolina. This corresponding stage four analysis is on the right. You can see pretty much the only place it really missed was extending the precipitation uh, into Georgia, which Tracy pointed out in her plots to be a struggle for the model to extend the precipitation to the southwest. And then the seven component members of the SSEO are, are plotted here. So you see the two time lag high-res windows on the left, and then the high-res windows initialized at the ensemble 12 to 28th time. This will work, man mess, that pile's NMM run here on the right. What you see is that time lag runs, especially 
have the precipitation farther to the north and east. The other two high-res windows correctly extended the precipitation to the southwest and really do a pretty good job capturing the extent into Georgia. The models initialized off of NAM conditions seem to struggle a little bit more extending the precipitation uh, into Georgia. Another thing I'll point out is that the NMM seems to be uh, pretty hot with its magnitude of precipitation, especially looking at more of the scattered precipitation that occurred over Kentucky and West Virginia to Ohio in pretty high amounts, which contributes to the mean being higher in those areas where the analysis didn't really have those higher amounts. At the spring experiment, they had an SSEO parallel, which substituted this NMM, which uh, tends to perform a little more poorly with a variant of the HER. They also had an upgraded version of either the NAMNAS or the NAMRR. I um, didn't really remember correctly, but uh, the parallel seems to perform a little better than the version of the SSEO with those two muscle substitutions. Moving ahead to the next 24-hour period, the 12th to 29th, so the period ending at uh, 12 to 30th. This is when the uh, precipitation continued in South Carolina associated with Bonnie, but you really got that narrow corridor precipitation extending uh, to the northeast on the I-95 corridor. And seeing the uh, analysis here on the bottom right, you see that you know, narrow swath with amounts um, over an inch east of D.C. and eastern Virginia, and pretty much following uh, I-95, and eventually bisects New Jersey. What you see in uh, the 12-hour lagged high-res windows, precipitation corridors a little too far uh, to the northwest. And then in South Carolina, precipitation is a little too far to the northeast. With those high-res windows initialized, cultured at 12Z on the 29th. Precipitation on the Georgia, South Carolina border is more accurately placed. And then the corridor uh, to the east of D.C. is also more accurately placed, as you would expect with the model initialized later. Then looking at uh, the models initialized with uh, the NAM initial conditions, you can see that the Georgia and South Carolina precipitation is missed uh, in all of them, which again, I'm suggesting that perhaps it is a product of the initial conditions, considering the NMMD high-risk window did capture that using the rapid initial conditions. Again, here, the NMM, you see it's uh, pretty high precipitation amounts um, all across this domain, which again, in the SSEO parallels with the experiment looking at, they substitute that out for the HER, so it's hoping to increase uh, the skill of the SFPO in general. Looking at the NCAR ensemble, uh, they run those only at 0Z, this is 0Z on the 29th. I changed the stage 4 analysis to use their color bar here. You can see that uh, in the mean sense, their ensemble really washes out that uh, northern corridor that bisects New Jersey, um, really keying in on North Carolina and South Carolina uh, precipitation. Looking at the, the individual members of that ensemble, some of the members really missed out entirely on that uh, northern band of precipitation. Number six here doesn't really have it. Number eight, number four is really light. But the members that uh, do have it do a pretty good job with its location, okay, for instance, number five and number nine in on the observed quarter pretty well. So this is an instance in which looking at an ensemble mean doesn't really do the job for you. You really have to look more at the members. Or I also looked at uh, the neighborhood probabilities and bigger than one inch uh, plots, which I'm not showing here, but that also does a better job of keying in on the possibility of that northern corridor of precipitation. And finally, looking at uh, comparisons of parallel her and uh, the three kilometer of NAMRR compared to stage four analysis again on the right column. And these are three consecutive cycles initialized 22Z on the 28th, 23Z on the 28th, 0Z on the 29th in this bottom row. You can see that the, the HER trends heavier and more into Georgia <coughs> in these three consecutive cycles, sort of getting closer to what actually verified um, with the, as initialization time near verification time. The NAMRR, more consistent with the precipitation amounts, so it's doing maybe a little too heavy, doing a relatively good job, but it seems uh, more persistent on keeping the precipitation in South Carolina. Here at June 29th, it does start to move precipitation into Georgia. Overall, 
both these models doing a relatively good job with that precipitation. Moving to the next 24-hour period, a period where you had this uh, narrow corridor in eastern Virginia through New Jersey, you can see that there's more of a difference between the HER and the MRR. The HER X uh, did, again, trend towards capturing that corridor better as you move from the 12Z 29th initialization to the 14Z 29th initialization in the bottom row. Starts to do a pretty good job capturing that corridor. They're still a little too far to the northwest in southeastern Pennsylvania compared to New Jersey. But you can see that the NAMRR uh, struggled with that, with all three of these runs really lacking any coherent signal of that uh, rain band. It was really only when that band started forming uh, that the NAMRR did capture that corridor, which I didn't show any of those runs here. But for these more extended lead time runs of the MLR, I struggled with that. So I'll let Tracy show her findings. Okay. Um, so the overall findings, uh, the models did start to show signs of a potential tropical system really a week out, and even before that, uh, they were hinting at it. Again, we had that uh, ridge in the uh, well, I saw in Weatherbell, they used ridge over troubled waters as the phrase to describe it. Um, if you had low pressure in the Caribbean. It seemed that the Canadian was uh, was too fast for some of those earlier cycles on the 25th and 26th. I didn't show some of those plots, but they're in the extra slides. The GFS was uh, way too weak for the 120-hour uh, forecast, but also for many of the forecasts. Uh, the, the Canadian, European, and GFS all did suggest at least in some of their cycles, that Bonnie would stall east of South Carolina. Uh, the Canadian tended to be uh, the model that showed less of a stall and more of a northward advancement. Um, and then the model started to suggest more of a east-northeast turn, uh, which is what we're seeing now um, by the 12Z 28th cycle. And the H wharf often tracked too far to the north and was also too strong along with the, G the GFCL. Uh, in fact, all the GFS, the GFDL, H work were all a little bit too far to the north for many of those cycles. Uh, the models were eventually in pretty good agreement on the track towards South Carolina, but then they diverged after that. Uh, the, the GFS hinted that Bonnie would stall, whereas the other models didn't really show that. Uh, the GFDL was too strong for some of those later forecasts on the 28th and 30, and the 30th. GFS had the lowest track errors. H work had the largest track errors. And then the GFS had the largest intensity errors because it was much too weak. Um, and the H warp and GFDL were often just a little bit too strong. And then finally, for the precipitation, which we've already gone over, um, all the models, it seems, uh, underestimated the rainfall in South Carolina and especially into uh, Georgia. And the models really never picked up uh, on that heavy rainfall until right before the event. Uh, the GEM looked the best in the longer ranges. Uh, the other models had the heavy precip over the ocean uh, and not over land. That very narrow band seems uh, to be a struggle for the models. Um, the forecasts tended to be not concentrated enough. The GEM, I noticed, tend to overdo the precipitation, had too wide of an area of uh, the heavier rainfall. And the WPC day two forecasts were also um, just too broad. But day one forecast ended up uh, going more narrow, closer to the verification. And the SSEO forecasts were not bad, but they, again, as we mentioned, uh, struggled to capture the rainfall into Georgia. And the HERX and the NAMRR seemed to start off just a little bit too far to the south and east and also struggled to capture that Georgia rainfall. And the, uh, I noticed the HERX is missing heavier rainfall to the north initially, but then as it updated, it um, in the later cycle started to pick up on that rainfall to the north. And the NAMRR seemed to struggle missing that heavier rainfall in uh, Virginia and to the north. And I thought I would just end with this. Um, this is the latest from the National Hurricane Center, the five-day outlook. So this could be Colin next week. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, thank you, Tracy. I suggest we move on. And, um, hey, Jeff, can you transfer control to TJ? Can the other region do that? Seven, can you reach and can you transfer control to TJ?
should be on the way. Okay, can you see me now? No. I see you in southern region. Okay, I see a table. See a table, okay, that means I need to move over here. And what I, I, I'll, uh, okay, let me just send out the email real quick with the link. Um, where am I? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll send this out as an email afterwards and, and uh, this presentation. And I'll just get started here in the interest of time. So can everybody see um, a presentation that's titled QP, uh, GFS QPF Bias? Well, I can. That's good enough. OK. All right. So <clears throat> what, I, what I wanted to talk about, I mean, a lot of this is known already, but um, I, I wanted to maybe fill you in a little bit on some of the implications of the low um, of, of some of the QPF biases that we're, we're seeing, uh, kind of the way we, we um, uh, inf infer other things from it uh, in Central Region. So first thing I'd like to do, if this will let me, is start out with, um, I took some verification for the GFS, and I started it on the 12th, basically kind of right um, as, we, as we got into the new version of the GFS. And the first thing I wanted to do is, is just show how, um, how it verified for all forecasts uh, during basically the latter half of May. And uh, one thing to note is in the right-hand column there, uh, GFS rank among guidance, you'll notice that especially in the short term, we've got a lot of different sources of guidance to choose from. I won't go into all the details now, but in central region, at least, we're running a lot. We have a lot of different options for, for QPF and other things. A lot of them are based on uh, consensus of, of uh, different models. There's also model output statistics. There's, there's just a whole smorgasbord of stuff. But the thing that really jumped out at me here was the fact that uh, it, the GFS didn't do very well in the short range, but it actually did quite well at longer range relative to the relative to the models. But again, this is this is factoring in all forecasts for what was really not a very wet month. So if I go to the top ten wettest events, and that's that's kind of a generous way of putting it because if you look uh, in the uh, average QPE per grid box, basically it's figuring out the, the events that were the wettest. And the best we could muster for average rain over our Grand Rapids forecast area was only six uh, hundredths of an inch, which is not really impressive at all. But um, one thing that kind of jumps out is when you start dealing with greater amounts of precipitation, even, even getting near a tenth of an inch, it looks like maybe the results are flipped a little bit. It's kind of mixed results. You see a 22 out of 22 there for guidance. Um, and the other thing that was kind of interesting was that uh, it was on the dry side later on. Now, that said, I mean, this is a really small sample size, I realize. You know, this is only half a month. And in this particular case, there's only 10 events. But I thought that was kind of interesting. So I just thought I'd share that. So the next thing I want to share is uh, QPF verification using uh, contingency tables. And so what we're doing here is, is basically the forecasts are uh, in the columns and the verifications in the rows. And you, you'll notice that the QPF amounts are uh, going from 100 to a quarter to half, et cetera. And what's happening there is, is they're binned and they're centered around those values. So for example, um, if you had a, um, if you were forecasting anywhere between uh, five, actually, I think that's wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, between, that really should be five, uh, thousandths of an inch instead of zero, zero, 005. But in any case, it's centered around those values. So anything from just under one hundredth of an inch to about um, 0.12 inches will verify, verify that bin. Then when you get to 0 0.25, you, you kind of see the method here where it's, it's taking the halfway point between each of those values it's centered around, and it's using that as verification. I believe the QPE that's used, I'm not entirely sure. I know we've we've moved over to the, the IRMA, but in the past we've actually been using RFC, um, um, Quality Controlled Stage 4 uh, QPE. But, but the thing I really like is that this is, um, 
this is a very objective way of verifying, generally speaking. We're not using a, a model first guess to verify against model forecasts, which can be a little um, incestuous sometimes. This is actually taking um, actual QPF fields. Um, so that's kind of neat. So what you see here is nothing that's really a surprise. You see for events where it's centered, um, where it's centered uh, around zero. So that would basically go from zero to probably 0 0.05 uh, or 0 0.04. You see a massive tendency to overforecast. We've got in this particular case a 12-hour forecast, about 82,000. But then, but then even by the time you go up to 0 0.01, uh, which again, that should be 0 0.005 instead of 0 0.05. But even by the time you get there, you start to see the forecast is is much better calibrated. So, so there definitely seems to be improved skill once you get, you know, in the in the 0.01 to 0.1 range. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then higher up, we just basically didn't have a lot of hits. You know, we just haven't really been able to build up a sample size yet. So you kind of have um, what I was saying summarized there at the bottom left. And I'll just jump ahead and show, attempt to anyway, that this also applies 36, 48 hours. Uh, the, the trend is pretty steady. So, so this is what we pretty much know, that there's this wet bias down low. Now, what, what's the significance of that? Um, well, you know, we, we uh, use probability of precipitation forecasts, and we don't have really any way to get directly get it from a deterministic model, as you know. So we, we basically have to fudge it. And uh, the way we do that, I'll show on the next slide, is uh, it's a very rough kind of calculation. There's the things we use called smart init's, which um, is probably a generous way of putting it, because it's just you know it's just basically taking very empirical calculations um, of of the fields that come out of the models, and then try to come up with other things. And so in the case of POP, you'll notice in the equation here, it's all about the QPF. It's directly tied to the QPF which, uh, as you might expect, um, will have some implications if there's a wet bias with low QPF values. So this equation here, if you plot it up, it's going to look something like this. And so I've got the QPF values uh, on, the, on the bottom axis there. And one thing, I'll, one thing I'll say, and this is a lot of this is kind of old school stuff that we've done for a while, but, but just to give you a little background, um, Generally speaking, if we've got pops that are less than 15%, we're not really going to mention it. Um, it's not going to really be advertised. But once you start getting above 15%, you'll start getting into slight chance and even chance. And so that gets kind of interesting, because using this equation, that would suggest then by the time you get um, 0 0.008 inches of rain, that would, using this very um, crude equation, that would actually start getting us uh, probability of precipitation. And notice then after 0.01, the, there's, there's a lot more sensitivity to the pop forecast. And that, you know, that matters to a lot of people, going 50% versus 20 or 30% or less than 20% if you're talking about weekend picnics and, and stuff like that. Now, I mean, I, I'm not saying that that's in a way, this really isn't your problem. This is just kind of the way we derive stuff. But I just kind of want to let you know what, what some of the implications are that we're facing here in the field. So if you, knowing all of that, if you look, um, we, we've seen the wet bias that, that really shows up when you've got very low values of QPF, you know, right around the 0 0.01 or less um, range. And so I wanted to just take Memorial Day, where uh, it, it ended up being a very nice day, very dry, and there were a lot of indications that it would be a very dry day. But if you look at the um, some of the reliability forecast, you see that uh, there's there is that wet bias showing up. Um, and so, thinking back to the previous um, graph, we've got a lot of uh, 10 and 20 percent that are that are um, kind of probably related to those very low QPF amounts. And and I was talking to some of the forecasters here. And they were saying it was kind of frustrating because, you know, our hands were tied a little bit by the smart nits we use, and, and we were we were getting a lot of slight chance, chance, slight chance, that type of thing, when there were pretty good indications that it was going to be a dry forecast, um, and that just you know so that just kind of shows how that 
uh, low that QPF bias at low values is sort of infiltrating a little bit. And the other thing I'll say is that uh, we also use a consensus model that that is weighted with the GFS, and I've had some forecasters note that that does tend to skew things a little bit. Now, I'm no, I don't want to just throw GFS under the bus, because if you look even at the European deterministic model, you do see some of the same issues going on. I mean, it's maybe a little better, but it's not, you know, it's not the silver bullet. So a lot of this, I think, points back to the way we're de deriving probability of precipitation, and that's kind of one of the things I want to uh, you know, talk with some of the developers are about. So I guess to, to follow this up, um, you know, I, there's been talk about populist tendencies, which I, you can correct me if, if my interpretation on this is wrong, but my understanding is that is populist means it's going to take the very low values and be, you know, pretty liberal with them, maybe spread them out a little bit, which would explain a lot of what I, what I just showed you. So, uh, one of the things I'd be interested to know is um, using that threshold that we have. Is there a w perhaps we should use a different cutoff? I don't. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. And uh, that's pretty much what I had at this point. So I'm happy to take any any questions. Yeah, DJ, this is uh, Jeff Manikin. Um, are, are you aware of the uh, on AWIPS the products labeled as NAM, DNG, which are smart in it uh, derived, uh, products derived here at NSEP that include probability of precipitation forecasts that are a blend of that same method applied to the NAM nest and, uh, and the SHREF? Yeah, I am. And, and, I, and I won't show you right now in the interest of time, but when I've, um, when I've plotted bias tables, I actually did that earlier, and I decided, in the interest of time, not to not to show it. But the the results on that were kind of mixed. You know, I was looking for wet biases and dry biases and that type of thing. But yeah, it's it's something I should probably look at a little more. And I and I do believe that in this in this consensus I was talking about, you know, where it's it's a kludge of all these different sources of guidance. Those things you mentioned are also in it as well. Well, well, thank you for presenting. I, I've, I've got a few things to show here coming up that may tie in to why we're seeing the GFS generate the light precip amount. So, um, Jack, if, if, if Southern Region can get control back here, I think we'll pop right into that. You seeing that? Yep. Should be good. Do I need to go on the screen? Jack, do I do I have the screen now? You should. I should now. Jack, I I may have done a, a, a hit the wrong thing. Can you do try it one more time, please? Back to TJ and then back to you, sorry. You should be back with you, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right, are uh, we in business now, I think? <laughs> So uh, you have to indulge me for a, a quick moment here. Uh, 21 years ago, right to today, was the uh, at that time the uh, the best day in the uh, project vortex. The initial uh, project vortex uh, went into my archives here. Pulled out these two pictures from the uh, far west uh, Texas uh, Panhandle. Uh, again, uh, at that time, the uh, uh, two most uh, studied tornadic storms. Again, 21 years ago uh, to the date. So uh, thank you for uh, indulging me on that uh, trip down memory lane. I um, want to start here. I'm going to tie in nicely to what TJ uh, just showed. Um, we heard this week from the uh, uh, Hastings, Nebraska office, the GFS has been generating a lot of too much light QPF in regimes that really support only 
that support convection, but the shallow, non-precipitating type in, in both the atmosphere and the model. And here's the uh, a satellite picture. This is uh, from the 18th of May. You can see a, a very healthy Q field here over uh, Nebraska and, and Kansas, but no rain, just uh, you know, a good mixing and uh, significant diurnal-driven uh, uh, shallow cumulus. These are uh, picked really, really short-range forecasts to eliminate synoptic uh, issues. These are six-hour forecasts right at the very start of uh, NAM and GFS runs on that afternoon. And you know, no precip was observed anywhere here in Nebraska, Kansas. But you can see the GFS has some coverage here of very light amounts, but, uh, but, but they're there. And if you break it down, that's total. I'm sorry, and that's, that, that's total, that's convective. You can see that we're dealing with convective precip uh, here. Uh, these are the uh, 0, 3, and 6 hour surface based CAPE forecast from the NAM and the GFS on the bottom. They all have, you know, a couple hundred joules per kilogram of, uh, of CAPE in that area, but certainly nothing uh, uh, impressive in terms of instability. So let's look at some forecast soundings for Hastings. These are it'll be NAM on top, GFS uh, on the bottom, and overall the uh, forecast soundings are, are fairly similar here at the start. The NAM's a little bit uh, warmer and, and drier in, in the boundary layer, but it uh, has a, a saturated layer at the top, uh, possibly some uh, again at the top of the uh, uh, cumulus stack. GFS has a, a saturated layer a little bit uh, right in kind of the same uh, area. Overall, again, generally the same structure. Three hours later, you see the, uh, the GFS has moistened a little bit here in the boundary layer. Um, may have not much change, but the GFS going from here to here has cranked out 0.01 precip. This certainly seems like a sounding where the shallow convective scheme should kick in, but the deep scheme to generate precip really shouldn't. And again, somehow this is kicking off that 0.01 that we're seeing. If you go three hours later, now the GFS has started to dry out, but uh, it's generated another 0.01, uh, a precip. The NAM hasn't generated anything. We only have three-hour uh, soundings here from the uh, GFS, so we can't break it down by hour. But again, somehow here in this evolution in the bottom, we're getting uh, 0.02 of, of precip. And here's, uh, let's go a little bit north to Grand Island. Again, here's FO3 and FO6. Out of this sounding here, which again, you have you know, room for you know, some shallow uh, cumulus clouds to grow, uh, in this three-hour period, 0.02 inches of, of precip is coming out of the convective scheme and going from here to here. The, uh, again, overall, the, uh, the structures and the soundings are not terribly different, but the NAM is correctly not generating any precip out of that. This is um, from one of um, Glenn's uh, uh, presentations earlier in the year where it was a, a review of um, the uh, uh, precip scores in the, at that time, the operational GFS in, in black and then the parallel, which is now the operational GFS in the red. And there were certainly signs here that the bias was increased in the uh, low amounts and the, uh, the skill actually at the very lowest uh, amounts uh, uh, drops off uh, a smidge as well. But there's a sign here that the new version has slightly increased the uh, amounts of, of very light precip. And I, I picked a, uh, just at random, I, I pulled yesterday's forecast, um, with yesterday's 12Z cycle. This is six hour. Uh, precip in the first six hours, NAM top, GFS bottom. Oops, sorry, I don't know right where, uh, I think something got knocked off here. But anyway, you'll, you'll see that the, the coverage here right in the first six hours of the light amounts in the uh, GFS is noticeably higher uh, than in, uh, in the NAM. And I, I think what's going on is the shallow in environments that really support active shallow convection, somehow it's able to generate a little bit of precip. 
Um, this really is supposed to be the next six hour period, so I don't know what happened to that, so I apologize. But here, in that case here, here's a, a Dulles, Virginia, which is another example of where and like 0.02 is being cranked out by the GFS. Here's the uh, NAM evolution and the GFS evolution here on the bottom. And again, somehow going from here to here, we're getting preset. So again, I don't have a good explanation why. The, uh, as far as I know, the convective scheme itself was not changed in the uh, new version of the GFS, uh, but it's somehow the response is such that these environments, again, which, which favor that you know, cumulus mixing are generating light, some out, light amounts of precip. And uh, it's certainly going to be worthy of further investigation as to, to why. Probably a great upgrade made it slightly worse. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. It, it seemed, uh, the, for what it's worth, yeah, I mean, the, the, the stats are there, but the, I, I will say that a couple offices have noted it that it's it's sticking out to them a lot more since the upgrade. So, um, you know, it's you know we made the atmosphere warmer and drier, so we reduced this um, popular strain, and we uh, found that that was we had severely impacted the severe weather. So we put in. I, I have a question. Uh, Jeff in, the, uh, in uh, Kansas City. Yep. Go ahead, Jeff. So, see, is this the same problem? I remember a few years ago we had a problem where we were, it was a similar problem with the GFS, and then it was fixed. And then we saw this mixing issue. So have we basically gone back and we've sort of fixed the mixing issue and brought this back, or is this a different problem? Uh, I don't think we know the answer yet. <laughs> if anyone in the global group wants to chime in, I, I, I think we have to figure that one out, Jeff. Okay, because it just seems so eerily similar to the to what we had a few years ago. And it just, it's like you, you fix, so this must be part of the madness. You fix one thing and break another. But uh, anyways, I appreciate the it was a very good presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this, this is Andy. I want to just concur with what Jeff Craven said. That was my aging memory. I was sitting here looking, thinking the same thing. So I think Jeff, Jeff has a really good question. Uh, we totally agree. Here's a, another issue. Do you have the observed sounding? Not for those events, which we, we just kind of picked these out at the last second. We can, we'll certainly be able to find a case any day, where we'll, and, and that will be the next step to see how the soundings compare. But again, clearly, you know, the fact that they're very short-term soundings, they're probably fairly skillful, and, and the, the NAM and GSS are similar. One's putting out precip, one isn't, and it's not an environment that should favor precip generation. Um, issue number two that's kind of popped up recently is the GFS seems to be generating too much convective precip over the Great Lakes, which are, are still pretty cold right now. Here's a, uh, from a, a few days ago, uh, a 12C site close the first six hours. Here's the uh, next six hours taking up to zero Z, and you can kind of see here the, uh, the the NAMs on top, GFS on the bottom, and the uh, the GFS really wants to uh, crank out some nice precip here, especially over Huron. Here's a really pronounced six hours later from zero to sixty. Um, you can see that the uh, the difference between the NAM and the GFS here over the lakes is uh, is pretty striking. Really yeah, although this right here is out in the middle. It, it, yeah, I mean, this here certainly is favored within the, in the boundaries of the lake pretty clearly. This is tucked in nicely right into the corner. This is tucked into the southwest corner of Erie, and it's you know, going on out here over Ontario uh, as well. And again, it, just to compare, that's total. Here's convective. It, it's all a convective scheme um, ticking in. 
you look at the observed, you know, there was there was a, a, a some convection over Illinois and uh, Wisconsin that spilled out into Lake Michigan, and there were uh, a few weaker cells further east, but. I don't think anything actually in, in reality developed out over the water like the, uh, the GFS had. If you look at the uh, surface-based tape forecast valid at zero Z, uh, the, you know, if you look in uh, you know, southwest Lake Erie, you know, I, is, this, is the GFS you know, struggling a little bit with the position of the coastline, or is that just a, uh, an artifact of the output grid? I, I don't have a good answer to that. But if you look up here over Huron, um, where uh, things uh, fired. You can see there really isn't much surface based tape there, and we had a lot of, of convective precip form after this time right there. So we'll look at a, a series of soundings for a, a Lake Huron uh, uh, buoy. And if you, this is the three hour precip from the GFS at this site. And uh, you can see after zero Z, it really cranks out the, uh, the uh, heavy precip, goes uh, well over an inch uh, in this period. The water temperatures in this area are in the uh, mid to upper 40s, I believe. Air temperatures are right around 50 or so. So we'll start at uh, 12Z, man on top, GFS on the bottom. They uh, both have the, uh, an inversion. As, as usual, the man is a little bit more pronounced with the uh, strength of the inversion. Um, the uh, uh, GFS maybe is missing or doesn't agree that there's this pocket of drier air up here. But uh, three hours later, you kind of sense here, you know, that the uh, temperature and, and dew point lines are, are trying to move closer, like, like it's moving towards a, a convective uh, a steady state. Then by three hours later, it's, it's, the GFS is saturated. The man has some saturated layers, too, but isn't getting precip. We are getting precip here out of the uh, GFS three hours later. Now the zero Z, you can see again the... GFS has cut down the strength of the inversion relative to the NAM, but overall, with a similar low-level structure, they both have a fair amount of dry air in the low levels. But now, again, the, the GFS is really cranking out the heavy precip at this, oops, sorry, at this time, um, several tenths between here and here. You can see it's moistened, and we're generating a lot of precip. And it's not obvious to me why the... Uh, it could just go through the evolution why the GFS convective scheme should be so aggressive in, uh, in generating precip there. So again, this is more showing what's going on and, and raising the, the issues and saying we need to look into this more because it's not obvious to me what's going on there, why the scheme is, is, is so aggressive over the cold waters. So again, the, the convective scheme seems overly active right now in the GFS. Uh, the first issue is that there's lots of very light precip being generated in shallow convective regimes. The second is that we seem to be getting a lot of heavier convection that's not really surface-based out of cold Great Lakes. And there's no upgrade to the convective scheme in the recent upgrade. So somehow the convective scheme has become more sensitive to something and uh, can't really say more than that. Um, are they sure that it didn't happen before? No, uh, but the the Great I don't, if, if anyone is can comment from the Great Lakes region, is is this? It seems at least enhanced to me the issue with the heavy precip over the Great Lakes, and that's what was implied in one message we got. Can can anyone comment on that? Yeah, Jeff, this is Greg in Detroit. That is that is true. It's at least enhanced. I'm not sure. It's at least much more noticeable now than it was in the past, if it did exist in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, the issue of the two-meter dew points was brought up, too. And what we saw in the two-meter dew points over the, great, over the northern Great Plains, which includes the Midwest, um, was that in the late spring, early summer, we have a wet bias in the dew point. We had it in the old model, and we enhanced it by about a degree Celsius in the new model. And it's averaged over, you know, pretty much a season and over the, great, over the northern Great Plain. So we've enhanced the, uh, you know, a wet bias at the surface. We have. I mean, and, and we'll certainly 
need to do a presentation here coming up on the fact of the dew points in the GFS. Now, so far, the spring in the northern plains, Great Lakes, have been very high. But I, I, I'm not sure, at least directly, if that ties into that. You know, like for the first yeah. example, six-hour forecast, you know, 200 joules per kilogram of Cape. So it's not like, you know, uh, enhanced low-level moisture is, is pumping up the instability. Somehow, the convective scheme is just is, is generating precip out of uh, a sounding that it, it, it shouldn't. And again, it, just, it seems like that's an, something at least enhanced, if, if not new. So. Um, I looked at the Great Lakes as a whole, and it seemed like when you had the precip, there was some tendency to have more Cape, uh, in terms of uh, over the Great Lakes as a whole, the Cape would be two or three hundred. I'd be interested. Yeah, and I mean, here again, you know, there's certainly, you know, maybe the, uh, if you start a parcel, if you start a parcel a little bit above the surface, you know, there is a little bit of Cape to, uh, to, to work with. But again, it's just, it's just, it just doesn't scream well, like an environment here that you know, favors uh, uh, at least as mu certainly as much convection as was initiated in the model. Um, it seems to be that the oh. rainfall over the Great Lakes is occurring when the temperature, two meter temperature, um, and the two point was about the same. I don't know. We can look. Yeah. Any other uh, comments on the line? Um, this is uh, Frank Awesome. I actually have a comment about uh, Bonnie, but um, I'll wait if there's other comments on this topic. Yeah, uh, Frank, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, feel free to talk about Bonnie. Um, yeah, in my experience working the system, it, it seemed as if there was a, the models had a hard time understanding um, the strength of the uh, upper level support from the uh, vort that was over Georgia, um, then uh, for some reason underdoing the precip on the west side of the track that extended into southeast Georgia. It seemed uh, fairly clear when you were looking at the way that the water vapor was uh, unfolding during the event that uh, that was a favored region synoptically to get the heavy rain. And so I, I found it odd that there wasn't the, the model seem to be missing that for some reason. Hmm. So, a, a, a very useful finding. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can look into that aspect a little bit more. Thanks for pointing it out. Comments in the room? Questions? Solutions? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Thank, thanks, everyone.